Okay, welcome everyone and um, thank you for joining us. Uh, good evening if you're in the UK, good morning if you're in Australia or, or wherever you may be. And um, we're really excited for episode number 82 and we're joined by Professor Franco Impelazeri. And um, by way of, of brief sort of introduction to him, he has an incredible amount of years of experience as a coach himself. He has a PhD in uh, sports science. He's a pr professor in sport and exercise science and medicine at UTS in Sydney. Um, so he has an incredible amount of, I believe the phrase is skin in the game. And uh, what some of you may know him from, um, from the, the internet and from Twitter, he's an incredibly passionate scientist and man and we've assured him that it's 10 p.m here in the uk it's past the watershed so he's allowed to say what he wants and swear words are definitely uh, encouraged and allowed um and the topic is going to be i guess what he may well be most well known for on social media but from by some of us in the podiatry world and that is his um contesting or challenging of the acute to quant chronic workload ratio and franco has an, an incredible amount of experience in load monitoring and, and things like rpe and things so this comes from a very scientific um scientific position so we can look forward to in, in time asking him about some of the conceptual and i guess methodological flaws that he sees with it and some of the papers he's published about it um, and just in case you're not sure what the acute to chronic workload ratio is i'd encourage you to go back to episode 58 where we had uh, Dr. Tim Gabbett on and um, perhaps give that one a watch first and then and then come back here so you've got the, the two sides of the coin so to speak. So Franco, firstly thank you so much for joining us, it's a real pleasure. Thank you, thank you Craig, thank you Ian, uh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> and we're really looking forward to this one, um, particularly after doing the load management and acute to chronic episode with, with Tim um, and now having this which is the other sort of side of the discussion just to be as as scientific as possible and to make sure we're not leaving any any stone unturned before we get to the, the fun stuff and the critique which is fun as a scientist we, we, we'd really appreciate if you could give us a bit of a, a history lesson in monitoring load because certainly I speak to some podiatry colleagues and, and they're aware of the acute to chronic workload ratio but they they're of the belief that that's sort of where load monitoring began and obviously it has a far far deeper history than that it goes back many many more years than that so do you mind just giving us a bit of a backstory into monitoring load in general and perhaps some of the some of the other things that the acute to chronic work workload ratio was based upon yeah um, the, the the idea to try to find a way to quantify training load is an old idea if we think that uh, the Bannister model, which is actually the model on which uh, the acute chronic uh, workload ratio is supposed to be based, uh, it, it is uh, from the 70s. So we are talking about uh, 50 years ago uh, now. And it was an attempt to find a way to predict performance and to describe performance uh, based on uh, on uh, training load measures, so the banister try to to model the relation between training load and and the performance, and to model you know uh, they needed a measure to quantify training load, and they developed the so called TRIMP, which is uh, calculated usually with the heart rate, but can be calculated also with the power and other indicators. So we are talking about a lot of years ago. Um, after about 20 years, uh, there were other attempts to quantify the training load. So let's say 20 years ago, there was also the performance uh, potential model uh, of PEARL that tried to quantify the load. And the uh, training load uh, was also an interesting area in the, in the, in the, um, for understanding over training uh, because there are uh, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there were some uh, theories say that if you train too much, you can risk uh, to increase your injury risk. So again, it's, it's, it's really an old idea, but if we take uh, the, the concept behind, because people now uh, start to say that uh, the, the acute chronic is sensitized uh, about the overload progression the overload progression that actually was developed more in resistance training um is uh, uh um, can be tracked back to the lower in the 50s so we are talking about 70 years ago so when people say that this uh, acute chronic uh, rise an important issue i think there were there, there is a problem in, edu in the education probably 
because uh, if the the practitioners didn't realize before the acute chronic that uh, the overload progression and these training principles uh, are important in designing uh, a training program i think there's a, a serious issue in the, in the education system so uh, the that's a bit the the story it's uh, it's a story that started almost 70 years ago uh, now okay now with the new technologies uh, we have different ways different metrics to try to quantify the training load the main issue when quantifying the training load is to understand what and why you are quantifying something and this is a bit the the battle that we are fighting to to explain people that uh, you don't have to rely to a metric because this metric uh, exists you have to try to understand what are the information that you need and based on the information you select the metric that can give you that, that information yeah so shortly that's uh, that's a bit the history brilliant so am i right in my understanding that all of these sort of prior models were very much focused on, on performance. There wasn't much talk about predicting predicting injury or, or any talk of predicting injury. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these, all the models I mentioned uh, were developed for uh, modeling performance. The Manister model actually is calculated, uh, uh, is, a um, is a computational method based on which you, uh, you enter in the equation uh, the performance and based on the performance, you calculate the so-called time decays. So the, the, the time that uh, the, each individual uh, need for dissipating the negative effects of training and the, and the, and the, um, and the positive effects. So the, the two components of the Bannister model are two uh, exponential equation uh, the, in which the, the, the training load uh, is weighted using this uh, time decays. In the, in the acute chronic uh, uh, workload ratio, these uh, uh, equations uh, have been substituted by average. And, and now with some more uh, sophisticated uh, methods uh, with an exponential uh, equation, but the original uh, model just substituted with, uh, with the two average, which is a, an over simplification of the original model. But yes, you're right. It, it was developed for performance and i have to be honest it, it doesn't work so well even for performance because the problem is that these models tend to be the, to, to overfit a bit the data so they describe in an acceptable way uh, the data that you enter in the model but when you use it as a uh, in terms of a prediction it doesn't work so well uh, so there, there, there are some problems also with the performance, but the extension to injuries is, is uh, let's say, a liberal interpretation. And we, we, we said more than once that it, it makes not a lot of sense that something that you apply for performance uh, can be applied for injuries. I mean, there, no one have, uh, uh, since uh, the, the introduction, introduction of this uh, ratio have explained uh, uh, the, the physiological or biomechanical or whatever rationale linking these models uh, to the injuries. So, I mean, as a as a coach and as a as a scientist, a sports scientist, I guess, uh, and even as us as clinicians, the idea of having something which allows us to sort of, you know, weigh up the fitness and the fatigue or the 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 chronic base load of of fitness and the acute sort of work we've recently done and the promise that that would perhaps allow us to maximize performance or predict or minimize injury you, it, it's seductive um it, it's enticing F from your perspective you know knowing what you knew about the history of load monitoring that being so ingrained within load monitoring when this first sort of came around and I think it was around 2014 and correct me if I'm wrong but that was the kind of first time I noticed it in the literature at least yeah. um I guess people that didn't have the the background in in load monitoring that you did would look at it as something new be su seduced by it uh, and I'm, I'm probably talking about myself here as well and and then roll with it could you just speak to how you as a scientist as a coach when it when it first came out and you read it what was your first reaction when you read this because you probably weren't seduced the way I was you probably were you thinking well this isn't anything new did it did it in, interest you at all what was your first reaction when you saw it yeah uh, consider that yes it, it started in 2014 with the first paper of uh, Billy Yulin um, and 
at that time I was working in a clinical setting. So I wasn't doing a lot in sports science and I received some uh, requests from friends and colleagues to collaborate in studies uh, using this acute chronic uh, workload ratio. And that was the time that I realized there was this new metric uh, because I wasn't following uh, so well the literature because I was concentrating on, on my let's say, new job, which, is, which was in orthopedics. So I just had, honestly, I just had a look, a quick look, and I found the concept uh, very intriguing, uh, but I, I realized there was something wrong because uh, they showed me the, the U-shaped model and the U-shaped the -shape model predict uh, or uh, show that uh, the, if you recover or if you taper, you increase the injury risk, which was weird. So I said, I wasn't convinced. So I refused to collaborate because I said, if I collaborate, I should understand a, a bit more about this matrix. And to be honest, it, it finished there because uh, it, was my, it wasn't my main interest. But as a coach, I found a bit really weird. So not as a scientist, but the messages provided were a bit uh, strange because uh, not only if you recover or if you taper, uh, seems you increase the injury risk, but the message, which was uh, again, that if you increase too much too soon, uh, may be dangerous is something that any coach uh, already knew at that time. So I, I didn't see this matrix very useful. In addition, the idea to use one single matrix uh, uh, for answering to a so complex uh, problem, it, it looked a bit too redu reductionist. So the, I was skeptical since the beginning, but because of the concept behind, and the, they mentioned in the first papers also the the, um, uh, tr the stress balance uh, uh, of Kogan that actually I used I, I, I used because um, when I was in Italy I was working also with professional cyclists so and these are matrix that have been developed for endurance sports all the matrix I mentioned mainly for endurance sports not for team sports uh, so I was familiar also with that matrix and was completely different by the way because they they use uh, an additive model with two exponential components um, so uh, as I said that the, the, when I start to, to see this, uh, this model going around uh, as a coach I found quite weird that that idea not as a scientist of course after when it came back in sports science try to address the problem uh, from a scientific point of view yeah. I mean that, that's interesting Franco that, the, that perhaps the the response to it say in the sports science world was probably very different to the response in the sports medical world and and I, by way of my background I mean I, I grew up with the 10 percent rule um, I used it in my own running I used it in my own clinical practice and assessing athletes. And if the 10% rule didn't work, we went to the 5% rule. So like Ian, when the when I first became familiar with the acute to chronic workload ratio, that alleged cutoff point where the risk was, was about 10%. So as a clinician, that made a lot of sense to me. But then again, I didn't have the sports science background to perhaps think it through um, as a sports scientist perhaps would or someone with a coaching background. So it, 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 to me at the time, it actually made some reasonable sense. It, it sort of fitted in with that 10% rule, which we knew the evidence was not exactly supporting. And on the yeah. surface, this is though looked as though, oh, this, this actually doesn't look too bad. <laughs> Yeah, actually, no, you're right, because uh, there were some papers published uh, by Tim Gabbett uh, in which it showed that uh, if you increase uh, the workload uh, more than 10%, you increase the injury risk. Uh, so basically supporting this 10% rule, even if after he published, that is a myth. So I, I still don't know if he is convinced or not that this 10% rule uh, can be useful. Basically, the, the, the message may be similar. So the 10% rule, of course, is a rule, uh, is a rule of thumb, which is uh, mm. uh, very generic, uh, but uh, sensitized to the, to, to the overall progression and say not to exaggerate in the overall progression. Even if sometimes when you coach someone, you may be forced or you may try something more extreme. And this is sometimes a part of the job. 
uh, and you have also to adapt your training load depending on the on the time you have at disposal for for preparing someone for the performance if you have just a few weeks mm. or you have two big uh, or important events very close sometimes <clears throat> you have to force when i was training i i, I also use uh, to induce overreaching for example uh, in order to 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 have a, a, a jump in performance, hoping to have a jump in performance that never happened actually. Mm. So, <laughs> but, uh, it's um, yeah, it, it, it's something like the ten percent rule, which is an easy answer to a complex question. And the acute mm. chronic workload ratio does exactly the same. Provide people with uh, an easy answer to a complex question, so you don't have to struggle too much. You have an indicator. You use that indicator and it seems the work is done and it seems that the work is done in an evidence-based uh, in an evidence-based uh, manner uh, but mm. as, you, as you probably know for me science is, is a very serious uh, issue and uh, when we talk about evidence uh, we have to be sure that what we are presenting is an evidence and most of our uh, work uh, is to show that this evidence is not that strong as people think and sometimes it's very very weak uh, as we have shown uh, in uh, in our recent papers actually just a, a slightly sideways question which we may come back to could it be different depending on the sport like my, my background is running you know to work out the 10 percent rule to work out the acute to chronic workload ratio is really easy you know it's miles per week could it be different for other sports where it's much more complex to try and work out the loads? I think it's complex for any sport because I also train some uh, marathon runners uh, with uh, two hour and 12. Mm. So I may say I, I'm a good coach. The problem is that this guy was uh, was much better before I trained. So <laughs> even if, uh, sometimes uh, you look a good coach, uh, but just because you have some talent, that mm. can compensate the, the mistakes that you, that you make. But um, uh, no, I think uh, the, the, the complexity of understanding what's the right dose for the athletes is, uh, is um, complicated uh, in, in any sport. Uh, the advantage of sports like running is or cycling is that uh, the training that you plan, it's uh, usually more close to the training that they they really do this uh, doesn't happen sometimes in team sports because they have a lot of spontaneous activities so let's say the small side the games or the competition or the matches uh, that provide the training stimulus uh, there's no way you can predict what they can do you can have an idea but you don't know exactly what they are doing and that's why monitoring is important because you need to know what they have really done even if you plan some sort of uh, progression in the training Mm -hmm. uh, with running or cycling, it's easier because if I tell you to run, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, <clears throat> 10, meet, 10, 10 minutes uh, at that uh, intensity, at that pace, and after you recover for five minutes, uh, it's easier for you to follow my, my program. And uh, in team sport, this is much more complicated. So it's not a question of, uh, of um, it, it, it's more a, a feasibility problem. The, the, the training program in, in sports, in team sports, uh, is more uh, complex because you cannot predict uh, accurately how much load they will, they are going to, to do in, in the real uh, situation. Before we go down the much deeper hole of, of the acute chronic workload ratio, sort of conceptual and, and methodological flaws, can we quickly sidestep into just just a quick definition, um, uh, a quick summary of a definition, and that is the the term overtraining. I know we, we we always talk about sort of not wanting athletes to become overtrained, and these ratios and percentages hopefully help us not overtrain someone. But recently, listened to uh, yourself and your colleague from uh, UTS, uh, Aaron Coots, listen to your your podcast, our uh, Vern Gambetta's podcast, mm -hmm. and you all, a couple of you were in sort of agreement that. Um, you'd very rarely ever seen an overtrained athlete. Could you just explain that comment to, to us and, and what overtraining means, if anything? Yeah, that's uh, actually a common experience of most coaches working with, uh, with athletes and high-level athletes. 
um, overtraining. I also, when I speak with coaches, sometimes I use the term overtraining, even if overtraining is a term that should be used very rarely because overtraining, if we use some, uh, let's say, um, established definitions, uh, uh, means that you have a drop in performance uh, for even if you recover that lasts more than six months. So it's a very severe condition. And what I can say, and what we discuss is that in reality, the real overtraining, so someone that has a drop in performance lasting six months, one year, a long time, despite you, you do whatever you can for recovering, is, is a very rare uh, situation. Uh, with more than, let's say, hundreds of... Uh, hundreds of uh, cyclists that I have seen just uh, a bunch can be uh, could be considered overtrained and this uh, um, uh, this also because of some situations in which we think uh, that uh, the athletes are overtrained in reality can be justified by um, other conditions for example we found out that most of these uh, athletes had uh, a, a, a viral infection. Um, so there are sometimes medical conditions that uh, explain why there was this drop in performance. So, so yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Where does overuse injury, another commonly used term, where does that fit into this uh, discussion? The idea is that uh, the association is easy, and that's why the overuse injury are associated with. Uh, have been associated with uh, um, overtraining because uh, overtraining um, means that you are training a lot. And if you are training a lot, you are covering a lot of distances, a lot of uh, uh, whatever. And uh, and so it's easy to associate overtraining to overuse injury. So it's uh, also a terminological association. And as uh, it, it makes sense because if I train a lot, I increase the risk of of creating problems to my system, uh, muscle skeletal system. So that's why it, it, it was associated, and there was Keebler in the uh, uh, at the end of the nineties, uh, also developing and proposing a theory uh, uh, linking the overtraining to uh, overuse injuries uh, based on the overload on the tissues. And, and uh, it makes sense, of course. These are just theories because uh, 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 in terms of, of sport, uh, uh, the evidence is not that strong, but there are studies, uh, um, more control in other fields, more physiological and more biomechanical that have shown that uh, um, if you increase the load on a tissue, you can you create a da damage that can increase the risk of rupture of the structure. So it makes sense from a conceptual point of view, absolutely. And that's why it's associated. And I guess the, the, the point I'm angling towards here is um, one of the first papers of yours I read in the BJSM, which was when you were referring to the, the phrase, the new phrase, training load error. Um, this new sort of term of, you know, um, this is a training load error. And you said, and you, I, I believe the title of the paper was, Training load error is, is no different to, oh, Craig's going to pull it up. Uh, training load error is not a more accurate term than overuse injury. Now, t talk us through um, what yours and your, and your, and your co-authors were, were sort of thinking um, when, when you sort of sat down to write this paper. Yeah, because the, there was a, this, uh, this paper was a sort of um, a counterpoint to another paper published on the on British Journal of Sport Medicine. Uh, suggesting to change uh, uh, the the term uh, overuse injury to training load error, and uh, we just we were just thinking that it was uh, a strange uh, a strange suggestion. It uh, honestly, and this is what we have written. Uh, it, it makes not a lot of sense, as in a let's say provocative provo provocative way we wrote on the uh, on this opinion piece is that. If you change, uh, if you want to change uh, in this way the uh, uh, overuse injury, we, we may suggest uh, to change also the re-injury as a rehabilitation error injury. So you generate a sort of uh, of uh, 
um, again, simplification of a complex problem that's changing the name, and you, you, you move the attention on one component of uh, the, the web of, uh, of uh, co potential causes of injuries. Because if you think about uh, that's only a problem with training load error, you don't focus your attention to other aspects of uh, the athlete's life that is important. So that in that opinion piece, we, we try to explain this, that it makes no sense to, to rename in this way and is a, is a, a bit uh, arbitrary. And, the, and this way to approach the problem of injuries, focusing too much on training load, uh, in my opinion, it, it doesn't help a lot. Also because we have to think that when we work with athletes, we, we, we have to train the athletes. So we cannot say, oh, let's train a bit less. It depends on the situation. If uh, when I, I was training my athletes for uh, World Championship or Olympic Games, uh, uh, we, we had to train uh, and to go there, not just to participate, but to win. So uh, what we need to do is to, to have athletes that uh, are strong enough and robust enough to cope and to tolerate the training that we need or we want to, to provide for improving performance. So the, the, the changing the name of overuse injuries uh, may be a provoking um, article or whatever but to be honest it's it's really it, it makes not a lot of sense and we just try to write this of course uh, uh, the I'm, I don't have anything to uh, because it was proposed by it was proposed by um, uh, drew that I know is, is a good guy so it's it's not there's nothing personal it's just that he proposed this idea and we just uh, explain that we don't agree with these ideas after that people can do of course whatever they want uh, craig's just pulled up a, a comment here i guess from facebook oh it's gone again craig um it's from derek uh hi derek I didn't realize you're watching derek is a um a physio who's got a phd in pain he's no slouch as a runner either he's like a 230 marathon guy uh, overuse injury not an accurate uh, also not an accurate term because for many such injuries, there's no radiological or histological evidence of, uh, air quotes, injury. Instead, it fits uh, biomechanical reasoning. Um, is, is that kind of what you're saying, Franco, that overuse injury was a was a was not a perfect term to start with, but what we were doing there was we were taking one and we were replacing it with another term, which was no, no more or less perfect either. Was that your kind of message? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, of course, it depends always on, on the, on the, meaning we attributed different terms uh, in the paper we we just presented uh, uh, other definitions provided uh, in other context uh, for overuse so yes overuse can be a bit misleading but there are other proposals uh, that uh, suggest how to interpret this term so but, but the question was not that we we had a, a, a better idea it was uh, that the solution that had been provided uh, was not very helpful. Yeah. So I agree that uh, overuse can be a bit misleading, but that's why we need to clarify what we mean by overuse. So to be honest, I'm not very scared about the terminology uh, uh, unless the terminology is, is uh, loaded with uh, misleading, uh, um, misleading information like uh, training load errors. Uh, so I, I, I agree with, uh, with Eric that yeah. also this may be misleading, but it it's be. not, I, I mean, maybe the, we need the consensus to define better these terms. That's not my job, to be honest. My job is to, uh, since I work in, in, in sport and on training load uh, is, uh, uh, to avoid that the, the new terms are introduced, moving the attention on, uh, uh not so relevant uh, issues yeah cool so let's get to the fun bit then the 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 meat of the discussion and um uh, when it comes to acute chronic workload ratio since 2014 i tried to do a bit of a search earlier today just to see how many papers have been published on it and to be honest i, I it was just almost impossible to do there were there were hun potentially hundreds I, I just didn't know where where the, where the search ended um as such like any body of literature you suddenly start meta-analyses meta and, and systematic reviews start popping up. And interestingly, we had two systematic reviews on this. 
um, both published this calendar year within a couple of months of each other. Craig, have you got them there to pull up just so we can highlight the work for anyone listening after the fact or listening to the podcast? We will link them in the in the in the comments below. Um, this was the first one by which one's this? Is this the um, I can't see that writing. It's too small, Craig. Is this uh, Mopin et al? I think it is, isn't it? Anyway, yeah, um, there's a Mopin one. Yep. So this one is the relationship between acute chronic workload ratio and injury risk, a systematic review. And then there was the Andrade uh, et al. one, which was literally about five weeks later. I think Craig's just going to pull that one up now. Um, and that was, uh, I don't have the title in front of me. Craig's going to bail me out here. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, um, yeah. Is, acute, is acute chronic workload ratio associated with risk of time loss? So essentially the same, the same systematic review. We would assume from the same search and the same body of literature. Now, the interesting thing to me, as, as always with these topics, is when different groups of authors looking at the same number data come up with slightly different interpretations and different conclusions. I guess this is the beauty of, 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 uh, of science and research. And one group of authors here were, were fairly conservative in their comments. I'm just glancing down at my notes here. Acute chronic workload ratio may be related to injury, but it has issues. Um, and I'm guessing that's kind of in keeping uh, with with where your head's at the another group the other group said um they were much sort of firmer in their conclusions and sort of stated um that its relationship with injury was 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 a bit was a bit more solid how, what are your thoughts on this and how can two groups of scientists or research sort of yeah, come to different conclusions looking at the same data yeah we wrote something in our last paper about these uh radios because we comment on, on a radio of griffin for example the problem is that systematic reviews uh, are quite common now, probably are quite abused. I'm not talking about acute chronic ratio, but overall. But to run a proper uh, systematic review is not that easy. I mean, it, it's easy, but you should follow established guidelines. And this is commonly not followed. Uh, regarding the acute chronic ratio, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I try to be polite. There's a bias. <laughs> no, there's absolutely bias. Now, we don't know because uh, initially we wanted to write a letter to the editor, but they may be annoyed of, the, of these uh, things. So I, I'm, I'm going uh, now after the paper, we are going to publish. Uh, actually, these reviews uh, are losing strength or whatever the conclusion because. Uh, uh if you interpret uh, the associations uh in a strong way or in a weak way it doesn't change the fact that these associations are a statistical artifacts so mm, mm, i was thinking based on that that is not worth to go on with this uh, uh with this uh discussion anymore but we see but i, I can just tell you that that in the last review, there is uh, is reported uh, uh, a paper of uh, Delacroix with uh, there are two bars with a significant uh, association uh, and uh, showing that uh, high acute chronic workload ratio compared to low acute chronic ratio. So below one uh, is associated with injuries. What I can tell you is that in that uh, in that two bars, one is for uh, four weeks and the other is for three weeks. If I show you these, uh, only these two bars with the red uh, at the end, you may think, wow, this paper supports the acute chronic. But if I say that uh, for four weeks and three weeks, there were 11 comparisons uh, for each. So 22 comparisons. Uh, so changing uh, the, the reference category, all these kind of things, and only two were significant, uh, that results for sure as a different weight. And, and that's the bias, because if I select the information that I report and then I don't explain how and why I select in this way, I can give you an impression that uh, it's a consistent this uh, this uh this association but if i just tell you you know there is a study showing that two comparison out of 22 are are significantly associated of course uh, you interpret in a different way if i avoid to tell you that there were 22 comparisons so this uh, this just to explain you that you you can do whatever you want with the number you can interpret as you like and you can select what to report uh, and that's why a systematic review should report everything. 
And but this is a, also a failure of the review process because the I think uh, it's difficult to have uh, um, to 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 know all the literature because there are so many papers. There are more than one hundred papers, and it's rare to find someone that has read all 100 papers and unfortunately this is something i did so i know all the papers uh, all the papers published so when they when i see <clears throat> an author cited in a review usually i also remember uh, more or less the results so i can i can and do the same example with the study of Fanchini that we use uh, for our because we use the same data set for our study they show they have four uh, um, comparison out of nine, which is less than 50% significant. And mm -hmm. again, and the, uh, only the four significant were presented. Mm -hmm. So th that's the reason of the bias. Um, I, I, I can tell that the, the also uh, in our journal, because I'm an editor of uh, science and medicine in football, another radio on acute chronic will be published just to show that I'm uh, I'm probably biased, but I don't. I try not to interfere with my job. So even if uh, I wouldn't even uh, 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 send to the reviewers, I actually uh, send to the reviewers, and uh, it's going to be published. So you said there there are a lot of rages, but others are coming out, and uh, I think there are at least two or three that are going to be published uh, soon because I was involved in some ways in the editorial process. So yeah, that's the reason uh, you can, yeah. you can uh, interpret the, the interpretation is, is, uh, is uh, subjective. So it can be biased. And I think it's ch this, is the, this highlights the challenge for coaches or, or clinicians uh, who are trying to be evidence-based and they're searching for the literature and whether it be that they only in their search find one of those reviews, just whichever one they happen upon, is the the way they will apply to to their practice, or perhaps they'll they'll cherry pick to fit their own existing narrative. I think what we essentially have here is two papers with slightly different views, and whichever one you pick, whichever side of the fence you sit on here, you could claim you're still being evidence based. And I think that's the kind of interesting position we we, we find ourselves in. One of the things we wanted to do here was to make sure that if people did find themselves in these positions, we served up as many other papers for them to go away and read, just to make sure they're reading. As much as possible and i want to come on to um your paper um i guess it's the, the big one really that, that talked about the the conceptual issues you have with acute to chronic i don't know if you've got it there craig it's the one that was in um uh international journal of sports physiology and performance yeah uh, what was the title yeah. what was the title frank uh, I think it's a uh, chronic workload ratio, methodological and, and pitfalls or something like that. Or was it the consensus yeah. statement one? No, no, no. 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 no it, it's the um, same journal, I think. Um, we're looking terribly unprofessional and, and unprepared here, and, and, and that's exactly what we are, frankly, so I apologise. Um, no, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> we're, we're very searching to, to pull that up. Could we just get into the real, the real, the film stuff? If, if someone said to you, right, okay, Give me the give me the the big three things. What are the biggest reasons that you have a problem conceptually, methodologically, with the acute yeah. What are the hits? Okay, so uh, in that paper we raise some uh, concern. Uh, first of all, I, I would like a bit to introduce the where everything started because uh, uh, no, one? It's, no, I it's another one. one. Yeah. yeah, I haven't got it. I haven't got it handy. Sorry. <laughs> Right. It's okay. It was published on the International Journal of Sport Physiology and Performance. I'll link uh, to it. I'll link it. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I start to raise my concern uh, about two years ago now in Bern uh, during a conference uh, in which uh, Tim Gabbett was present and there was uh, uh, also um, uh, Karen Kamp from the British Journal of Sport Medicine and there was also uh, Drew so there, there were people that have uh, proposed this, uh, this model and this uh, metric. So uh, while I had some concern even before, I, I waited for uh, that occasion to express my concerns to the proponent of the, of the acute chronic in person. Uh, I thought it was the, uh, 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 the right way to do, having the possibility to be in, in at conference at the same time. 
and uh, so and it was in that occasion that I start to read more uh, to go more in depth because I was asked to 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 do a, a talk uh, uh, critically appraising this uh, new metric. Um, after that, uh, I found out that there were uh, reading the literature, there were really serious problems. And uh, I was criticized because uh, I was told, yeah, but you just present in a conference, you haven't published, uh, so you haven't published this criticism on a peer review uh, journal. Yeah, that's the paper. And uh, so we did it. I have to say that uh, we have uh, other papers on, uh, in press and we took more than one year for the review process for various reasons. So once we published those, uh, this paper, uh, uh, in the meantime, people start to say, okay, but you have to, to show, uh, you have to demonstrate uh, with original uh, studies. So while it's, it's true that you need also original studies, I want to underline that most of the criticism I receive because uh, um, they, they said that uh, while on the other side there are people publishing all these uh, associations on our side, there were no papers uh, in that direction. I want to explain something about science because it seems to me that people or they don't know or they don't know and they ignore. Uh, in science, uh, you, you, you present uh, evidence, uh, so the evidence uh, is, are the results of your studies to support a theory. Uh, if uh, I have methodological concerns about this evidence, uh, I'm, uh, I'm allowed to raise these concerns. Uh, the, uh, the weaknesses of the studies uh, uh, are important to be recognized because they, um, they give the weight of those evidence. So what we were saying is that the evidence presented wasn't strong as people uh, were thinking. And this is why we, we criticize the, methodo uh, the methodology. And this does not require actually the, um, that I run original studies. We did uh, with, the, with the last paper, but it's not necessary. And this is a very, sorry, but it's a very stupid uh, 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 criticism I received because it, it really is in, ignores the, the, the rules of science. So is, is a, in a systematic review, you know, uh, there is an assessment that you should always do, which is the assessment of the risk of bias. So if someone criticizes and say that the study has a high risk of bias, what's the answer of the authors? Ah, okay, if you're, you, you criticize, you have to run your own studies to show. So th this is, was the point. We, we were uh, underlying the, the risk of bias and the methodological problem showing that those papers were not strong and mostly are wrong, completely wrong, like the U-shape that, you know, we asked the retraction because this is it's wrong. So I don't have to show that, demonstrate that uh, two plus two is not five, but is four. You are, so what are we talking about? So after this rant, uh, I, I, I go on with this paper. So in this paper, we summarize a bit some of the concerns because actually the concerns the methodological problems are, are really a lot, and I'm, I'm lucky. I'm lucky that also some uh, a very strong epidemiologists like Jan Schreer publish on sport medicine uh, concerns about this uh, uh, this metric. So it's not only uh, me and my friends, but it seems that someone else uh, has some concerns and uh, uh, much better epidemiologists than than I am. So in that paper, we we raised. Uh, various problems. One was the lack of a conceptual uh, framework. Um, and why this is important? Because if uh, you don't have a, a precise theory, um, it's difficult to run original studies to show the validity or not of a theory. And this is something that people asking me to, to run studies uh, and uh, understood absolutely because uh, uh, if you say, when you present an hypothesis, the hypothesis should be precise so that they can make uh, predictions uh, and precise predictions. When a theory is vogue and is very generic, uh, in, in science, this is uh, a theory with a very low degree of uh, falsifiability, which is not very good. So basically, 
when it's uh, so generic, you can uh, more or less justify whatever you want. It's like when uh, there are studies showing results in a different direction and people say, yes, but you know, because it's uh, multifactorial. Yes, we know it's multifactorial, but this is not the justification that the predictions are wrong. Because if they are wrong, the, the theory probably is too easy to, to uh, provide uh, uh, meaningful information given the complexity of the multifactorial, uh, of a multifactorial phenomenon. So the theory doesn't, doesn't work. So that's, that's the way you should interpret, not justify the different results because it's multifactorial. We know it's multifactorial. So we, we wanted to underline the lack of a conceptual framework. And the conceptual framework that was linked to, for example, the Bannister model, uh, as I said, is not quite strong because uh, uh, they uh, reinterpreted the Bannister model in a way that is completely different from the original Bannister model which is related to performance and not injuries that use uh, an additive model and not uh, a ratio. And, and, and that's the second point that we, we show in that paper. And uh, actually that paper has some original data from AFL and we show as uh, actually it was already done by Lolly, Atkinson, and Gregson and other uh, researchers that the ratio doesn't normalize and introduce noise actually. And in the last paper, we have also shown that introduce uh, statistical artifacts. So we repeated the analysis of, of Lolle and we showed that uh, the acute chronic ratio uh, is, a, is a bad normalization technique, let's say. And the, uh, the third point is, which is in my opinion, very important. And again, it seems people or don't, they don't want to understand or they, they really don't know. And so again, it's a problem of education. All these studies, and when I say all, I say 100% of these studies are all descriptive studies. Uh, there are just a bunch of studies that are try to be predictive. Uh, and this is important because if these studies are just showing descriptive associations, the only thing you can do, even assuming the study are run properly, is to develop uh, new theories and new hypotheses that, that after you can test. But all people interpret these associations and as a causal. Because uh, if you think that manipulating the training load based on this association, you are going to change the, the likelihood of the event, in this case, the injury, this means that you are attributing a causal effect. And none of these studies as, uh, as uh, um, established causal association or causal inferences. There are methods from observational studies to estimate uh, uh, causal effects, but these are uh, have been not used uh, in, uh, in all these uh, 100 uh, more studies. So we, we, in that paper, we try to remind that if there is no causal effect established, there's no way that you can suggest or recommend to change the explanatory variable to change the likelihood of the event because it's like suggesting to decrease the number of ice cream sold to decrease the shark attacks. Conceptually, it's exactly the same. And when I make this example, people think I'm exaggerating. No, I'm not exaggerating. It's exactly the same. We have associations and these associations are at best descriptive, which means that can be due to a, a common cause, for example, to compounders. We don't know. This means that these studies can have uh, uh, can be biased. There is a there is a problem which is a selection bias, a survivor bias that is almost ignored in in these in these studies. So we the, the three main points are the lack of uh, uh, conceptual framework. Uh, the uh, failure of the ratio to normalize and the, and the introduction of uh, noise uh, uh, to, to, to the matrix and the associations that are not uh, um, causal. And so you can use that for any kind of recommendation, even assuming that the other problems uh, are not really a problem. And this is uh, something I find really worrying because the, for science and medicine, is plenty of uh, descriptive associations interpreted as causal. I mean, you can think it's causal. You can also write, probably this is causal, 
and, and after if it's causal you can develop a prediction and you can check the prediction like should be done in science what we do in uh, in this area is we run uh, there are studies with more than 1000 comparisons there are studies using more than 300 combinations uh, to see if there is something significant and based on what is significant you you reshape the theory and uh, and and uh, and to justify your results so in my opinion this is not the best example of science it's not very helpful with with regard to the the ratio itself and the 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 the, the alleged sweet spot which i know is the the graph that you uh took took issue with and you you wrote to the bjsm about to i think get retracted because this graph has been published five six seven times when we talk about that ratio we, we speak to people who and, and, and you know we, we all have, have held this belief that if you're if you're within you know 0 0.8 and 1.2 you're safe and it's if you go outside of this your risk increases we also know that then and i think even when we spoke to tim about this on episode 58 he said yeah but you know what some people even if they're inside that sweet spot they may still get injured and even if you're some of them even if you've got a much higher ratio you'll just tolerate it um is that kind of the point that that it's either a rule or it isn't if we're going to bring in individuality then then this ratio is irrelevant i mean i guess what i'm coming around to is is there any harm in using it if people use it for its ease I'm not saying that you know rightly or wrongly they use it um clinically they, they they've read the research they've interpreted it their way is there any harm in them doing it what's the negative side to continuing using it uh, clinically pragmatically yeah, I can tell you what's the problem uh, that I try to show in some conferences. For example, if I wanted to use uh, this ratio to stay in the sweet spot uh, with my athletes, I had to cut almost 50% of the load because uh, after, uh, uh, after a recovery week or when you have competitions for which you, you taper and, uh, and or if you are like me, uh, I think most of the coaches uh, uh, use, uh, say, two, three weeks of load and one of recovery, two, three weeks of load and one of recovery. Every time you recover, uh, uh, when you come back uh, uh, to train your athletes, uh, if you don't want to go too high with the ratio, you have to cut the load. And this means that you have to decrease the load. So one of the problems of staying in the sweet spot, and this is actually a feedback I received from a lot of people that have tried to use this, uh, is that you tend to tr train less so you are under training and in my opinion if i i would uh, consider something a risk of injuries is not uh, uh, more than over training is uh, under training or at least as much as uh, over training so uh but the, the the sweet spot has been created as as you know in, a, in the wrong way uh, that famous curve and, uh, and when we ask the retraction they didn't retract, not because uh, the concerns we, we raised were wrong, but because they said that's just an illustrative uh, model. First of all, I would say that if, even if it's illustrative, but it's wrong, it's still wrong. So it doesn't matter, it's illustrative. The second is that that illustrative uh, uh, model was presented as valid model in the IOC consensus. So the IOC has promoted something which was uh, not validated, uh, was just presented as illustrative and uh, as a lot of basic errors uh, because they, I mean, it, people can go and see our attraction uh, request on, they can download and read, uh, but there are really a, a lot of basic errors that you cannot model in this way uh, in this way, the, those information, those data, even the, even the 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 um, they they call a likelihood of injury, they call a risk, uh, a, an injury rate. So there's nothing right in that in that figure, but it's in last illustrative, and so the British Journal decided not to retract. It's fine. Uh, I mean, it's not fine, but it, it's their decision. So, so we, we accept that. Um, so I'm a bit lost. <laughs> let me, let me keep it as, as, as applicable for us clinicians as, as possible. So if and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so call me on it if I've misinterpreted you, but I know you've got a paper coming out, which looked at the acute chronic workload ratio versus the acute 
random chronic workload ratio yeah. and they were equally as um predictive so to speak of, of of injury and i've certainly recall in the conclusion of that when i read it off of your research gate uh, page that you were fairly strong in your contention that this this the use of this uh, ratio should be discontinued so i guess what i'm asking is if people sort of go okay I, i'm on board with this where do we go from here if if, if there isn't um, if there is harm in continuing to use it if we accept the current literature that we should discontinue using it what does monitoring load what should monitoring load look like present day and, and moving forward yeah the the, the this is uh, something uh, we um, we are publishing soon uh, i think it's a question i hope of weeks uh, on journal uh, of a tra trainer uh, because uh, as you said uh, when we start to criticize people start to say okay but what do we do now and basically what we are saying is that you go on to do what you were doing before the acute chronic uh, ratio until we don't have something stronger and really evidence-based and uh, really helpful uh, which is uh, just monitoring to understand that uh, if what you plan is good uh, uh, is going as you plan or not what i want to say is that the the, the, the definition of a training program uh, is the job of, of uh, uh, um, a coach uh, or, in, or a, a physiotherapist in terms of rehabilitation or anyone. So the first point is to develop the program. It's not to understand how much uh, load uh, is right or not. What do you want to do? Uh, what's your goal? What do you want to achieve? You want to increase the strength of the muscle, the, the the, the, the strength of the structure. Uh, these are the main questions from which we should start. After that, you develop your program and you define your progression. It's not a number, it's not a matrix. So if uh, Craig said, says, okay, I want to increase 10% every week, it's fine. That's the uh, is decision, is, is, the, is the boss in that situation. He, he, he will uh, use... Uh, 10% uh, because he has some ideas that temp this 10% can be useful for increasing uh, in this way. And this is uh, uh, what everyone, every practitioner should do. Monitoring is a second step. Once I develop my program and I decide what to do based on the literature, based on what I have, uh, what I think, based on my speculation, because this, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty of the process. There are a lot of arbitrary decisions. So. Uh, so can be evidence based because I can decide to focus on the strength of uh, of the muscle. I, I can decide to train eccentrically a muscle based on the literature. But how much and how to develop the program is my is my uh, decision. Once I define the program, we use the, the these measures of monitoring to understand if the program is going as we plan. For example. So also the, the, the kind of metric and the, the training load measure depends on the goal. If I want to cover a certain amount of sprint or sprinting running uh, of high intensity running, because I think that, for example, sprinting uh, can improve some neuromuscular component, high intensity running can improve uh, some cardiovascular components, so decrease the, the fatigue and things like that. Uh, of course, I have a plan in my mind when I build the program, and I have to check with the with the right matrix. In that case, I will, I will use probably the high intensity distance. I will use the number of sprints. I can use the number of accelerations or whatever. I think reflect the goals of my training. And if I say, okay, I want to increase 10% for three weeks after I want to recover, and I want to cut 50%, and that's my program, I measure all these components to see if my pro program is going as I plan. So it's relatively easy, meaning that there's no metric that can tell you if what you are doing is right or wrong in terms of injury risk. What you can do is try, for example, to monitor the, the we are going to publish a paper on that, uh, uh, I hope in a few months, uh, the training tolerance. And this is what everyone uh, uh, does in, uh, in, uh, in, in practice. So when you have a patient, you, you, you adapt the load based on also on how the patient is responding to the, 
to this. It's not based on, on a number, okay? So that's the way to monitor. You have a plan, so the, the key component of the, all this process is still the brain of people, and now people seem to be a bit brainless when they use all these numbers. These are it's above these numbers, it's above, uh, below, so it's, it's right or wrong. It's not that easy. I, I coach for years and I, I still don't know how much uh, I have to increase the load. I use my experience, but it happened that I increased much uh, faster because we had a very close competition and they, it was fine. They had no problem at all. We had injuries in, in period in which the, there was not so much load in the, even in the preparation period. Uh, in endurance sports where the work is quite extensive, for example, there and, 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 and the load is still not very high. We had, anyway, we had injuries. So it's difficult to, to understand. And this is what people should accept. This is the uncertainty of our job. I mean, when there is someone entering your, in, 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 your, uh, in your gym or uh, wherever with the back pain, <laughs> the back pain, it, it's, a, it's a big problem because it's not that easy to understand how to treat that back pain. Mm. So, of course, it would be nice. And there are someone suggesting, for example, now there is a lot of discussion about the biomechanical approach, okay? And there's plenty of literature. I can raise the same issue with uh, this biomechanical approach to, to pain, okay? Uh, there are studies showing some association. There are others showing not, uh, there are no association. I can focus on those showing association. And it's easy to say, yes, if uh, you have some range of motion or something that is uh, above or below, uh, you, you have to treat or not to treat. It would be easy, it would be nice, but it doesn't work. And we know it doesn't work. So I think uh, that with this uh, acute chronic workload ratio, we are basically doing something similar. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me how to use the training load uh, monitoring for injury prevention, I can tell you that you can use the monitoring for injury prevention. You can use to monitor if what you have planned is, uh, has been done by your athlete. If this is good or not, it depends on how they respond. And you have to monitor the responses, not just the training load, the so-called training load, because training load management is something that you can do to adapt to the responses. If you if you are increasing a lot of the load in, in, in a team and you have some players saying that I'm fine, I have no problem, uh, the tests are good, uh, why I should cut because it's outside uh, this sweet spot, for example. If I have someone which is in the, in the sweet spot and, and tell you that, oh, you know, I'm, I feel tired, I feel like pain, what do you do? Of course, uh, probably you would cut the load in any case. And this is what we do as coaches. So coming back to the first question, when I start to approach this uh, concept, new concept, I found a bit, um, from a coach perspective, very reductionist and uh, not very helpful. I would say even, uh, even uh, dangerous because it push people to focus on the numbers and not to, to focus on the, the athlete uh, responses. Perfect. Sure, thanks, Frank. I think on that note, it's a good good note to finish. We've just gone over the hour, but before we finish, I just want to—I I actually have a lecture on um, load management that I've given a couple of times now that is aimed at clinicians, in which I, I go through a lot of these concepts. On my very last slide, I have a point that you've just proved correct, and that point was the importance of a good coach and a sports science in this whole thing. And I think you've you've proved that that really it's not as something as simple as perhaps clinicians have imagined in the past. So, so yeah, you know, thank you for that. Thank you for your time. You know, the hour's gone really, really quickly. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. No, maybe I didn't uh, respond to the last paper. What we did with the last paper that I think uh, is important because in the the one about the, the random uh, chronic load. So basically. Because that paper, in our opinion, we were thinking it closed the, the, the question because, in my opinion, it, it closes the question because we have shown that it's an artifact. What I mean by artifact is that um, we divided, since we, we, to demonstrate that the, is the ratio creating this artifact, what we did is that if it's the ratio, and it's not because the chronic load reflects the athletic preparation, because that's the theory. 
if I divide it for any similar number, I should find the same. And this is what we, we, we obtain. So we, we create random chronic loads uh, using the same average and then the vari and the standard deviation, let's say, to simulate the, the numbers of the original uh, uh, of the study. We create this random number. We divided uh, the individual acute load by these random numbers, and we found the same. In the paper, we have explained a bit more in detail why this happened. And this happened because it's just a rescaling. So basically, it's like to give an example that uh, can be easy to understand. It's like if you calculate the increase in injury risk for each meter of, uh, of distance that uh, someone ran, and you transform uh, uh, this risk in uh, the risk of uh, in, an increase in one kilometer. So basically, you have uh, the risk of one rise to an exponent of 1,000. This is what, uh, what happens with this uh, ratio. So this creates a statistical artifact and basically magnify just uh, the, the difference between injury and non-injured players in the acute load. And, and that's why I said all these reviews now, uh, the reason, even if I think they are biased, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to, to address uh, the problems of these reviews because uh, with this paper, we have shown that these are statistical artifacts. Rescaling is something you can do. So uh, it would make not a lot of sense to say increasing, I don't know, cardiovascular risk uh, after every one gram of, uh, of uh, body weight uh, would be a bit weird. So it would make sense to say uh, the increase in risk every one kilogram. But these are the situations in which rescaling is used. Not uh, in this case, uh, they, they, all the authors didn't, didn't know they were rescaling, they were rescaling uh, the, the other ratio or the relative risk from, uh, from the acute load. And we have shown this uh, uh, in, in this paper. The other thing we have shown is that when you create this ratio, you reclassify uh, the, the, the players so that uh, you may have uh, more injured players in the high category. And this is because the ratio creates an asymmetric, uh, is asymmetric. And what I mean is that if from 1,000, you go back to 800, you are decreasing 20%. When you come back from 800 to, to 1,000, you are increasing 25%. So the, the, using a ratio tend to give more importance to increase and uh, then decrease. And, and that's why, for example, there are statisticians saying that it's very risky to use ratio and they shouldn't be used unless they're really normalized. So this, uh, this paper, I mean, I don't know how people can defend the theory behind the, the, the workload, uh, acute chronic workload, if you can obtain the same dividing all the players by random numbers or by a fixed numbers. So for us, this, state, this study was a bit conclusive, but I know that it will not happen because the bias uh, is, is strong there. Well, we'll make sure to, to link all of the papers we've referred to, including that one, in the, in the comments on the Facebook pages. So if anyone's listening after the fact, on, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast, head over to our Facebook page and we'll, we'll list all of Franco's papers. If you can't get hold of any of them, uh, and I know a couple of them are, are, are open access on your research gate, um, Profile, but are you okay with are you okay with people contacting you? Um, yeah, sure. Full because I think the most the, the the more hurdles there are for people to read these papers, um, the less likely they are to to make that. It's an uncomfortable change moving away from a from a ratio we like to start with. So we we want to remove remove those hurdles. Um, before before we go, let me just say one last thing, and that is that throughout the throughout the ages. We know that scientists um, that have sort of had competing views and they've, they've scientifically clashed have, have, have been really good for the rest of us. Because when two really smart people have opposing ideas, I think all the way back to Newton and Hooke, and maybe the modern day version of that is uh, Impelizari and Gavit, I don't know. But I mean, um, oh. I think the, the fact that we've got two smart guys, you know, disagreeing is only good for the rest of us. Um, but you've 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 shared a, a like you say a conference room with Tim. We've had you both on. You both seem like very personable people. Do you secretly just sit back and have a beer together and laugh about everything? Are you best mates? Are you worst enemies? What, what's the deal when you meet Tim face to face? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, the, actually, that was the first time I met Tim. I didn't know him personally, and um, it it was uh, we didn't have. 
problem actually. I, I made my he made his presentation. I made mine. There was a very short debate after that. Uh, I I spoke with him. I said that uh, it wasn't and it isn't personal. It's just a scientific debate. And this is uh, there are people who are trying to push this uh, discussion on a personal level, uh, but it's not personal. If they want to move on a personal level, they can try. But uh, I mean, uh, for me, it can be team, but it can be uh, Captain America. It doesn't change. Uh, I mean. Uh, I would uh, I would do exactly the same, and this is normal in scientific discussion. So, if from something is uh, is uh, is proposing uh, a matrix, and we are saying that this matrix is not strong enough, and and we we we, we are I think with the last paper we have also demonstrated the problem is that uh, it's becoming a dogma. So there are people defending this matrix, uh, not questioning or rising doubts uh, or answering to our methodological concerns, but rising other kind of arguments, which is exactly what I see uh, after 20 years of skeptic society uh, for, for other, uh, for in complementary medicine, for example. So uh, uh, if I, we say, okay, there are these limitations, yeah, but in any case can be usable for uh, monitor overload progression. Yeah, maybe, but for, it wasn't proposed for that. It was proposed with a precise, uh, uh, for a precise reason, and and it was proposed because it's related to injury risk. That's the reason, not because you can track progression. There are at least one hundred methods that you can track progression. And if we want to talk about this method for tracking progression, we we change completely uh, area of discussion. And I don't think it's also it's good even for progression, to be honest. But this is this is another issue because. I would avoid ratios, uh, uh, and as suggested by several statisticians, I would always avoid ratio. Um, I'm even not com comfortable with the VO2 max uh, divided by kilograms and uh, body mass. So, but that, that's uh, that, that's the point. So I, I don't, I didn't have any personal issue. I don't have personal issue. It's a purely scientific. Uh, I know that. Maybe Tim can can take this personally because uh, he created uh, his career around uh, these uh, these kind of studies and metric. And I comment for for having tried to address this important topic. But now we have to go on. That's how science works. We have to recognize. Sometimes we have to recognize that we did mistakes. It's normal in the scientific process. We don't have to defend. I'm sorry to say that the last radio is a sort of last attempt of defense, uh, but. I mean, and now that I, in the future, I want people. I'm a bit annoyed by discussing with the people with this um, kind of a dogmatic approach. So, if you want to discuss, they have to show me that what we have uh, written is wrong. And now I, I, I answer in the same way. Now we have to show that this uh, statistical artifact uh, doesn't exist. If you want to go on discussing about the acute chronic. They, they ask us to demonstrate. Actually, at, at the beginning, I didn't want to do much more uh, in terms of studies. I, I said, I just raised my concern. I think they are strong methodologically. It's unquestionably, the studies are unquestionably weak. So it's done. People insisted we have done these studies. Actually, we have uh, one or two other studies on training load, uh, methodological study to show some other errors. And after I own, I'm done, I mean, People can go on. There's no way to convince someone that believe in God that God doesn't exist, because at, at one point, at one point, the discussion is moving in that direction, because every time we raise we raise some methodological concern that the, the people use straw men start to move on other on other issues. Yes, but. Uh, the, the message is important. The message is the message of uh, is the same message of the Lorman and the fifties. So the message, uh, of course, I have nothing against the overload progression, but that's not the question. This is moving the attention on something else. So uh, I just think that we, we people should understand that the training load uh, cannot tell you if the load is too much or too low, or if you are increasing or decreasing injury risk. It's just your brain and how you develop the program, your reasoning that can uh, give some suggestion. If uh, you find this metric useful for progression, it's okay, you can use whatever you want. I mean, you can use the average of one year if you find this helpful in your practice. 
I have no concern. Great. I'd urge people to follow Franco on Twitter, uh, not least because he's incredibly good value and you get to see him. Um, you get to see him has the discussions almost daily, but actually it's probably a great place to hang out and note when you and your, your, your colleagues uh, publish more work in this area. So I'll link to your Twitter profile below as well. So anyone that's on Twitter, get over and um, follow Franco there. But uh, oh, just thank you so much for your time, Franco. It's been, I could, no, I could carry on talking all night, but actually quite, it quite literally isn't coming up to half past 11 here. So I should probably, uh, I should probably head off. But yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank no, you, Jan. Thank you, Craig. Right. It was Thanks, a pleasure. Yeah, bye.